Welcome back, everybody. So this is Special Agent Brent Harrison talking about uh, cell phones, and we'll delve into that testimony in a little bit. But I want to talk about the latest development in court with my very special guest, criminal defense attorney Andell Brown. Andell, great to have you back here on the program. Always a pleasure. So what did we learn today? We learned that the defense is suspending their ambient defense. They're not going to bring it up now, but they might bring it up in the death penalty phase. So if that's the case, why did they do that? And what are they going to try to argue to try to get their client off? Well, it, to, to me, Jesse, what it sounds like, if they, they pretty much said that on the innocence or guilt phase, they waved the white flag and they know their client is going to be convicted. Previously, the only defense was the Ambien, the, the involuntary intoxication. And if that defense goes by the wayside, they're not bringing up, there really no, is nothing else that they have to argue. He is the person. They have not disputed the fact that he committed those acts. As you heard in the defense opening statement, the only question is, why? How did this happen? That's what the defense said. How did this father who helped his kids play baseball and coach the team and love his family more than anything get to this point? So they all already conceded that he got to that point and he is the person that committed those heinous acts. I think they're, they're simply moving their focus to try to prevent the death penalty phase. But when they get to the penalty phase of fighting off the death penalty by saying that this uh, voluntary intoxication or the medication he on was one of the mitigating factors. Innocence or guilt, I think that's a done deal. I think they've well, accepted the fact that he's going to be found guilty. But why the 180 on, uh, in the middle of the trial? And I, I mean, I guess did they have a, did something happen? Did they see the prosecution's case and said, uh oh, it seems pretty strong? We believe that the defense is going to call another uh, is going to call five or six witnesses tomorrow. So it looks like they're still putting up a fight in the guilt or innocence phase. Again, I, I get, I'm confused what the strategy is. Yeah, Jesse, to be honest with you, it's very confusing to me as well. But what I suspect is either having an issue with one of the experts that the testimony that they were going to give, they probably decided it wasn't strong enough once they found out the totalitarian, the totality mm -hmm. of the prosecution's case and also the totality of what we're going to put forth. It, it just seems very uncommon from listening to the opening statements by the defense. It appeared that there was some confusion in the way that they were even approaching that. One of the odd things that I noticed was that there was an objection during the opening statement by the prosecution, and it was sustained. Those types of objections are very rare during opening statements. It's usually a time in the trial where the, the attorney on either side is simply telling the jury what they believe the evidence will show. To have an objection given and sustained at that same time is very uncommon. So it kind of let us know that there was some confusion in the camp on the defense side. Besides that, their, their strategy seemed to be confused in the sense that on one hand, they tried to explain that, you know, he didn't do this type of thing unless he was on the ambient, but they also tried to blame the victim, it seemed like, as if she kept pulling pulling him in and then pushing him out, pulling him in and then pushing him back. They talked about the fact that she didn't get to certain meetings and other things on time. And there seemed to be a, a, a lack of focus in the way that they approached their opening statement. So this does not surprise me that in the middle of the trial, they're doing an about face and they're doing away with their ambient defense. Well, there's been a lot of surprises in this case, a lot of surprising testimony, both for us and the jurors. And again, we cannot wait for Amy Mason, James Coley's ex-girlfriend, to take the stand and hear what surprises she has to say. So, Andel, stand by. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. We are covering the James Colley case out of Florida, the man who is charged with killing two individuals by going on a shooting rampage. He's alleged to have killed his ex-wife, Amanda Colley, as well as her best friend, Lindy Dobbins, by opening fire in a house. And really, you heard from details of the survivors of this shooting about how awful and horrific it ultimately was. Now, on the stand right now is Special Agent Brent Harrison. He is a cell phone expert, and we believe this evidence is being introduced to track the movements 
presence of the defendant from the courthouse, because he, he remember earlier in the morning of the shooting, he was ordered by a judge to stay away from his wife, clearly didn't do that, and then to track his movements after that to the ultimate shooting. So let's go live and we can learn a little bit more about how this cell phone evidence is being used to track the defendant. This is the tower, as you can see, to the south. The time is 1906 hours, which is uh, 7 6 uh, p.m. on August 26, 2015. It seems to be moving um, west, sort of 210 area. Is that correct? Correct, south, southwest. Awesome. And the next slide, same thing um, time and uh, tower. Right. Uh, again, 1906 hours um, on the same day, August 26. It's uh, these are outgoing calls, and, and, and so the tower in the similar area, that 21095 right? Correct. Correct. Okay. The fifth slide is that the same tower, and now you see the. Um, Right. What is moved on that tower? The sector is that right. Right. The face um, handling call activity has shifted. It's a 240 degree orientation, and then it's August 26, and then it's, you see the times: uh, 1916 hours, 1917 hours, which, which is 716, 717 p.m. Okay. Can we spend some time on this slide? Um, if you could point out um, the area that we're in relative to that last slide, if you need me to. This is the previous tower, the previous slide, and then now we indicated a lesser movement, lesser travel. Um, all this communication occurred on this tower in this phase. And again, the times range from on August 26, um, 20. 220, which is 10 to 20 at 9 p.m., all the way up till 2340, uh, 2348, which is 1148, which is 9. Okay. So from 1020 p.m. to 1148 p.m., all of the activity is on this tower. Um, and what incident location is that tower closest to? The 1189 Garrison Drive. This next call occurred at 11.49 p.m. And, and what, where is this tower in relation to the tower we were just discussing? Previous tower is located here. This tower is to the north. And this next slide, is that the call at 11.50 p.m.? Yes, yeah, so you had one at, on this tower, 23.48. You had the next call on the tower to the north at 2349, and then at 2350, you moved back on this tower, which, based on this, the address, approximately the address, and the amount of calls throughout the time examined on this tower, we would consider this what we call the home tower. Um, basically, the phone spends a lot of time in this particular area. It lines up with that address. You can't tell us specifically where the handset is based on tower information, but it's consistent with being at or near that address. Okay, so we're learning a little bit more about cell phone evidence and how it's being used to track the defendant. Want to bring back on criminal defense attorney Andel Brown. I want to ask you about the series of text messages that we heard the defendant send to his ex-wife before the shooting. And remember, this is what the jury heard. They said these are the messages were, don't do nothing to me. I won't do nothing to you. I won't bring this up in court about what you really are, and we both know what you really are. You're lucky I don't tell our children about this. You're effing disgusting. That's what you are. Then he follows that up with a text message after, after, please talk to me, please. Amanda, baby, please, baby, this is the last time I'm calling today, please. So if you're sitting in the jury and you're listening to these messages that the defendant sent to the victim before the shooting, what are you thinking? It sounds like someone who is spiraling out of control. His situation seems to be becoming more and more desperate with every text message. And I think as a juror, if you sat and listened to that, you would think this is someone who pretty much lost it, snapped, and this heinous crime is the end result of that mindset. 
But if you're sitting in the defense, can't you say, oh, this is great. This is great for us. It shows that our client is mentally unstable. And look, he was on all these prescription medications. He wasn't in his right ma mind. Who in their right mind would send these kind of messages? Well, I, I think on the, on the prosecution side, you would say someone who is angry, someone who wants to be in control of the situation, the type of person that has feels as if they've been sworn that something's been taken. It's, it's the break yeah, into the house. And, and uh, I think we're cutting, we're, we're losing some of your audio. And I, so we're going to jump back to that question because it, it really is something we have to talk a little bit more about. Um, so when we get that worked out, we're going to jump back into the courtroom, learn a little bit more of some the cell phone evidence and how it's being used to track the defendant. So let's go back live into that Florida courtroom. We're tracking the movements of the defendant on the day of the shooting, but uh, I want to jump out of that and bring back on Andel Brown to talk about that question that I had. So we're learning so much of his erratic behavior and all the crazy text messages and calls that he left for his ex-wife. But I was, making, I was making the point that couldn't the defense use that and say, hey, listen, this shows that our client is mentally unstable. And yes, it fits into our narrative that it was prescription medication that was really the result of this behavior and not the man himself. Now, our, your answer was cut off before, so what do, you, what do you think about that argument? Jesse, I, I think it does, in some respect, play into the defense's theory that this was the person that is losing control. I think as the text messages progress, it seems to get more and more extreme, more and more desperate. However, I, I think the prosecution can easily rebut that in that this is not all about prescription medication. That's not the reason why he's losing control. He's losing control because he's angry. Losing control. He's losing control because he feels like he's losing his family. He feels like he's losing his wife. And while he is angry. And we can't, we, we, you know what's funny, Andal, we can't forget the fact that during a large part of this testimony, he was sitting in that courtroom with his head down, his, wasn't looking up, seemed a bit, I guess, ashamed. Well, so much to talk about in this case. We'll cover more after this short break. Welcome back, everybody. So we're covering the James Colley case out of Florida, this man who allegedly went on a shooting rampage that resulted in the death of his ex-wife, Amanda Colley, and her best friend, Lindy Dobbins. We heard some really incredible testimony in this case, including from a surviving witness, uh, Rachel Hendricks, who testified last week about what it was like to be there and have bullets flying all around and seeing her best friend uh, gunned down. It's a really incredible story. Now, what we're learning today is where was the defendant and at what point. There's a cell phone expert on the stand right now, you see him right there, talking about tracking the movements of the defendant. Because the day of the shooting is a really interesting one. Earlier in the morning, he was ordered by a judge to not have any contact with his wife. It was um, clear that he had been harassing his wife uh, on earlier occasions. We talked about it earlier, about the threatening uh, voicemails and text messages he had sent to her. At one point, he was burning her clothes. He stole things from her, her house, um, including sex toys. Really, uh, as horrible a situation as you can possibly have between two people. Now, what we're learning today is that the defense has, a, has suspended their Ambien defense. They were claiming initially that this was all a result of prescription medication. Well, they're not arguing that right now. They are going to suspend that and hold it off if, if and when uh, their client should be found guilty. If that becomes the case, they will bring all that evidence in during the death penalty phase. Now, what you heard the flavor of the defense say a little bit was, well, if he was such a threat, then why would his ex-wife, Amanda Colley, allow him to visit the children that they had? That's, I guess, the, the one question that they had. Um, it should also be noted that last week when the medical examiner came on the stand um, and was describing the injuries, James Colley held his head, covered his ears, and at one point put his head down on the defense table. He was uh, it, it maybe appeared ashamed, didn't want to, to hear any of this. It's hard to know which way to, to go with this. But we're going to jump back into this courtroom. There's a, so many moving parts, a lot to discuss, and we're going to talk more about it. But let's jump back in and track more of the defendant's movements of the day of the shooting. Welcome back, everybody. So let's talk a little bit more about this case with Andel Brown. So many moving parts, uh, a lot, of, lot to talk about. But I, I want to talk a little bit more about the, um, the physical behavior of the defendant. So, Andel, we saw last week that when the medical examiner testified, the defendant 
didn't want to have any part of it. He had his head down, face on the table, covering his ears. Again, we're trying to understand what's going on in that mind. The defense is saying that he's been on a prescription medication and is out of his mind. The, the prosecution is painting him as a cold-blooded killer. What's going on here? What can we glean from this kind of behavior in the courtroom? Tough to tell see from the side looking in. I think it can be cast in either way, the prosecution or the defense. The prosecution. Now he's calmed down and he realizes the gravity of what he's done. He just doesn't want to own up to it. And the defense will say this is someone who is horrified, who is contrite, who, who just looks at the situation and can't believe that this and wouldn't have done it otherwise had he been under the influence of the ambient, whatever else they're going to say is the reason why he did this. I think there were other medications that he were on. And they're saying, look, this is not someone that would do something like this. There are two ways to look at it in my opinion. Now, I think the prosecution is putting on a pretty strong case, and I think strategically they put the first witness as Rachel Hendricks, the surviving victim. I'm assuming that was good strategy, correct? Because her testimony has been standing out in my mind uh, probably more than anybody's. Well, that, that is riveting testimony, Jesse. I mean, someone who, who survived, who had someone going through the house searching for different people's hearing gunshots, people crying, people trying to escape and barely getting out of there with her life and calling 911 from a neighbor's house. You could hear the fear as she talks to them. So I think that was a great strategy. They, they came out, uh, for, for lack of a better term, with their best punch up front, and they really dealt a, a heavy blow to the defense with that testimony. I mean, you don't always get a surviving witness uh, uh, an true. eyewitness survivor. She talked about a bullet grazing her shoulder. Right. I mean, it, it almost doesn't get better than that, not to say that a situation where people wound up losing their lives and someone ends up injured is a good thing. But as far as testimony goes and getting uh, building a strong case, it, it doesn't get better than that. She saw someone that she knew who he was. She knew his voice. She experienced it, and she could tell the jury firsthand about what it was like to be there, hiding in that closet, that bullet grazing her. I, I mean, I can't even imagine. Amazing. I can't even imagine what she had to go through and also what she had to go through by jumping back on that stand to talk about that day. So we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back. A lot more to cover. Okay, that was Amy Mason. She dated the defendant at the time of the killings. Now, I thought she was going to be on for a longer amount of time. Kind of surprised she was on for that short. Um, but what did we learn from it? Let's bring back on uh, Andel Brown. So she wasn't on for a long time, uh, but what, was she, what did we learn from her? Well, one of the things that, that I found interesting, Jesse, was that there were numerous text message conversations going on throughout the course of the day and they had plans. They had plans for what they were going to do that weekend, other things like that. And I think the defense is arguing, or at least what they're trying to do, is move from the first degree, maybe down to a lesser of a second degree murder or a manslaughter, where they're saying, look, he didn't intend, go there intending to do that at that time. It's what happened, but it's not a first-degree premeditated murder. And I think they're going to use her testimony of the fact that they had plans. He's talking with her. He seems to be in a good place with his then-girlfriend that he didn't go to that house intending to commit murder that day. Or could it be the other way and say this is a cold, calculated, horrible human being who can, on one hand, be so lovey-dovey to one woman, while at the same time, he's plotting to kill his uh, ex-wife. And, and that's exactly what the prosecution is going to come back with, Jesse, in saying that it's, it's a casual day for him. It's, it's just like making a sandwich to go there and commit this horrible crime that affected so many people's lives. And one of the witnesses just barely escaping with her life. In most criminal cases, it's two sides of a coin. And I think that's going to be the prosecution's rebuttal. Now, from a human aspect, think about what she had to go through. So she was in a relationship 
with the defendant. She's looking at him there, and she's thinking about all the probably all the times that she had with him. Little did she know it would end up with him in a courtroom and him in handcuffs. You know, we, you saw her getting very emotional towards the end of her testimony, and I can imagine something like that is what was going through her mind. All the time she spent with this person and invested in him, she talks about the I love you text, to, to then know that that human being is capable of being what looks like a cold-blooded killer. I, I, incredible. It's incredible. It's the same kind of testimony we saw from Rachel Hendricks, the surviving witness, going into their shoes and thinking about what it's like for them to testify, I can't even imagine. Now, there's a new witness on the stand, Detective uh, David Causey, a digital forensics examiner. He might look familiar to you because he was already on the stand earlier. He was earlier on in the case, he talked about the cell phone, uh, uh, I believe some of what was recovered, the text messages and voicemails from the defendant and the victim's phone. So let's uh, jump back into the courtroom. Uh, this is live and let's learn what he has to say today. Well, 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 some more communications are being unearthed here in the James Colley case. Let's bring on Andal Brown. Oh, man. Oh, man. He, uh, he actually spelled whore wrong in one of them. Uh, what did you make from those messages that the jury just saw? Well, need for a, a, a potty mouth dictionary. I think those messages seem to indicate a lot of anger and angst. As he went down the line, one of the things that really sent chills to my body as I heard that text message on August, I believe it was the 5th, 2015, said, now she's going to pay. And that is That's really the, the crux of the prosecution's case. Yeah, I mean, when you're is trying to argue he, premeditated murder and that this was all a part of his plan, it, you, you, like you said, Andel, that's the that's the key right there. You have it actually in writing. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a quick break. They're going to a quick break. And when we come back, there's so much more to dis uh, dissect and discuss in this case out of Florida. Stay tuned. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with Andel Brown, criminal defense attorney. We're talking about this case. They're in a break right now. So we're learning, you, you know, you listen to the communications from the defendant. And we covered our other case, the Leon Williams case, where he had that police interview convicted probably based upon his own words. So when you're sitting there as a criminal defense attorney, and you are seeing up there for the big screen, and all the jury is seeing it, the messages that your client would have sent to the victim and also to the neighbor explaining how much she hated her and, and this and this and this and how he's threatening her and, and going to do something about it. What do you do as a defense attorney? Well, Jesse, uh, you know, we don't create the facts. We take the facts as they're given, and I think those are the facts in this case. I think what you have to do is look at the facts as they are, the legal standard, and figure out the best strategy for your client. In a case like this, I think the strategy is very obvious. They, they're not disputing identity. They haven't provided an alibi. I think what you have to do to avoid the death penalty is to try to argue a lesser included charge. I don't think that it's you know, Andel, I think we're breaking up a little bit. Sorry to cut you off. Uh, uh, we're going to try and work on that connection issue. Um, but you mentioned a good point that this is a death penalty case. And all the facts come into the minds of the jury as they determine what would ultimately be the sentence. First, they have to find him guilty. And we're still in that phase, the guilt or innocence phase. But what I want to play for you right now is the testimony from the chief medical examiner. And these details about what the victim suffered, you can only imagine, will go through the minds of the jury as they ultimately render their verdict. Let's play some of that testimony right now. So as the medical examiner recounted the wounds, the defendant himself put his head down on the table and could not even uh, listen to anything. Back here with Andel Brown, how important is that testimony, understanding the injuries, and also for the jury to look at the defendant, how he's responding to them? Well, Jesse, I think it tells us a lot. It, it speaks to, from the prosecution perspective, the horrific nature of the crime, the pain that that uh, she went through, Amanda Cauley went through during this incident, uh, the, all these gunshots to the leg, to the hand, these other things. And I 
I think that's why they're asking those questions. Those things may have not been lethal, but they were certainly painful and horrific as she she's tormented by these gunshots and ultimately loses her life. And James Colley has had to sit there and listen to the the pain that his actions have caused and the destruction, right. not yeah, only the physically, destruction, but that on is, the family that's, that's structure. The, that's really the way to say it, Andel. We'll take a quick break, Andel. Stay tuned. A lot more to cover. You know, as I watch Rachel Hendricks, the surviving victim in this shooting, you can't help but think about how brave she is to testify and tell her story. I'm here with Andel Brown. Andel, when you look at her as a witness, how effective was she for the prosecution? And is the defense able to poke any holes whatsoever in her testimony? I mean, Jesse, there's, there's no such thing as a perfect person or a perfect witness. But this witness seems to be as close as you're going to get from a prosecution perspective. I think her testimony was extremely powerful. Uh, not only the fact that she can identify this person, that she can accurately recollect what happened, but just the emotional power behind her testimony surviving that, that, that horrible incident, being in the closet, the gunshot grazing her, the horror that she felt. And you can kind of feel the tension in the room. I think she's a great witness for the prosecution. I don't think the defense is going to get very far trying to poke holes in her testimony. For me, she painted a picture of what that chaotic scene looked like. From him being there to the gunfire. I mean, this is a worst case scenario when you have a restraining order against an ex and they come to the house. This is, I'm visualizing it in my head. So that's important, right, to make that visualization and picture and make a picture in the minds of the jury. Absolutely, and I think what it does from a prosecution standpoint is that it shows the lengths to which James Colley was willing to go to disobey the court orders to, to talk about her dad with the neighbors, to monitor right. her, to come into this house trying to search for the man that she, he thought she was in a relationship with and ultimately killing her and her friends. I mean, I think it plays right into the hands of their theory for first-degree murder, the premeditated intent, the fact that he was angry and that she was going to pay as the text message we heard from the, the detective court. Now, Rachel Hendricks is not the only surviving victim. We also know that there is Lamar Dobberly. He was the man that was in a romantic relationship with Amanda Colley at the time of the shooting. I want to play you his testimony, and you remember, he was the intended target, as the prosecution says. It was believed that James Colley went to Amanda's residence to find this guy because he had an obsession over her, uh, her sex life, her romantic relationship. And let's not forget that he received a text message of a shirtless Dobberly mowing the grass. And perhaps that's what set him off, as the prosecution says. So let's play that testimony right now. That's Officer Matthew Hubbard, the person that arrested the defendant. Want to bring back in Andel Brown. You know, I, I can't help but think that, uh, so this guy was arrested in another state. Um, how many times in your experience are suspects arrested maybe in connection with other crimes and then they bring them back into being charged in that initial crime or they're, you know, going about their business and they're arrested for something totally innocuous, they're arrested in another state and brought back? How often does this happen? It's pretty common, Jesse, for an officer to initiate a traffic stop. Sometimes it's just as simple as a ticket. It's not even an additional crime. And to find out that this person is associated with something in another state or in that particular jurisdiction, here he was in Virginia, several states away, and apparently was involved in some type of road rage incident or trying to run someone off the road. At least that was the call made to 911. And it turned out that he was the person they were looking for from Florida accused of a double murder. So in other words, you're not just you commit a crime, don't think you leave and you do something else that you're going to be off the hook. It's going to happen a lot. And, uh, you know, we see it uh, sometimes in movies. You see somebody commits a crime and they break down your house and they come in and then it's not always the way it works. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, and uh, I know we have to sign you off. So thank you so much for joining us. Your insight was fantastic. 
Thanks for having me, Jesse. It's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. We'll take a quick break, and when we come back, a lot more to talk about. Stay tuned.